moving on from Internet of Things to artificial intelligence now, and what the highways industry can learn from that. Uh, Will Cavendish from Arup is here, and Andrew Eland from DeepMind, if Will would like to come up first. Thanks very much, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. So um, Andrew and myself are going to be talking for this next half an hour about artificial intelligence in transport. What can the highways industry learn? I'm the uh, global lead on digital um, in, in Arup. Um, but before I was that, I actually worked in DeepMind with Andrew, hence the connection. Um, Andrew will say a lot about himself, but um, he's at the moment the, the lead on health in DeepMind, but he ran Google Maps for 10 years and has an incredibly strong interest in and knowledge of the sort of transport and modeling sector. But I won't steal your thunder, Andrew. Um, so, uh, oh, that's the welcome. That's us, beautiful people, I don't think. So what's the claim? Uh, what's the sort of assertion? Um, I guess from my point of view, I think artificial intelligence and uh, advanced digital technologies um, will bring huge changes to the highway sector and will offer you know, significant new opportunities to improve mobility, widen access, improve infrastructure performance, and meet sustainability goals. Uh, I just want to sort of run through why I believe that's the case, what do I think um, is likely to happen in the highway sector, and give some flavor of what we in Arab are doing in order to pre prepare for that kind of future. So you know, when we look across um, actually every area of Arab's work, and indeed so much that's going on in the, in the wider world, we, we see artificial intelligence and advanced digital technologies uh, like blockchain or, digi or digital fabrication or um, connected vehicles and so on, you know, changing so many of our areas of work, including the transport sector. And just some, just some sort of flavor of the, that, that scale of change. So um, a little while back, there was a sort of a really fascinating piece of work done by MIT that looked at the uh, traffic system in New York, New York and said if you could centralize this and if you could optimize it um, and manage that as best as possible use, using machine learning or artificial intelligence, what would that do? And their, I think, modeling results suggested that you would satisfy all of New York's mobility demands with half of today's vehicles. It's that, that sort of scale of impact is likely to happen. So they, their conclusion was more silicon less asphalt. Um, likewise, ARK, which is a very, very uh, impressive research uh, organization, investment research organization, has really dug into the details of transport costs. And uh, their best estimate is that um, autonomous taxis, autonomous vehicles, for autonomous taxis, you know, will cost around about 70, 35 cents per passenger kilometer or mile, you know, compared to the cost of personal cars now or average taxes, so you're seeing a tenfold reduction in the cost of mobility compared to personal taxes. And we're seeing a bit of that in, in uh, Ali, Alibaba City Brain work in Hangzhou and in Kuala Lumpur, where uh, using artificial intelligence to optimize, in that case, traffic light systems has increasing uh, travel speeds um, significantly as you uh, use that to um, optimize performance. Likewise, we're seeing uh, new areas coming quite rapidly. So. Uh, machine learning based digital fabrication, that's a, that's a picture of a, a bridge that uh, Arup designed and built through, um, through 3D fabrication of steel. That's now in place in Amsterdam, it's a pedestrian bridge in place in Amsterdam. So that's more expensive than a normal bridge, but as you'd expect early on. But the research and the evolution of digital fabrication is happening at pace. And we're seeing those kinds of new materials um, being, being developed and, and put in place. Blockchain, of course, incredible amount of you know, um, stuff talking about blockchain, most of it uh, probably completely nonsense, but there is a core of the use of blockchain for distributed ledgers that's now, um, now beginning to happen in the world and including in the transport sector. So we're actually um, working with Dubai at the moment on a blockchain system for their vehicle, their, their vehicle registration uh, system over there, which they want to make transparent and they want to put in distributed, distributed ledger. And of course, machine learning systems are beginning to see them very strongly in intelligent asset management. So um, you know, that, that example there is uh, a digital twin of a long span bridge where we're beginning to bring together the uh, engineering and physical knowledge of the bridge with the data and the uh, digital swin in, in order to simulate performance, in order to predict maintenance, in order to um, construct degradation curves and so on. Again, all, all rooted in um, machine learning insights that can, can 
use intelligence and calculate, um, obviously, in a very impressive way. So I think, we, I think that those kinds of developments will bring quite significant opportunities for the highway sector. Um, you know, it seems like a, a very, very obvious thing that uh, hugely improved safety outcomes are possible in the highway sector through combination of better design and autonomous vehicles. There's an estimate of 90% reduction in traffic fatalities through that, through that combination. Obviously, quite quickly, we're going to see pervasive smart technology um, in, in all, all areas of our life, but including in, in roads and in, in transportation. We're seeing increasingly meaningful stakeholder engagement methods happening as a result of these kinds of technologies. So use of VR and AR now coming in mainstream into, uh, into transport uh, consultations and others, things like high-speed rail two, uh, road schemes now, using those as a way of uh, engaging, um, engaging citizens, engaging communities, and giving them a real sense of what something's going to look like. And of course, that use in design as well. And um, you know, clearly, with the advent of electric vehicles, the pathway to zero carbon highway sector, which is both uh, likely and, uh, and necessary. But I think also some, um, some new priorities and challenges as well. So um, we see quite significant sort of cost savings and reduced construction potentially coming out of this in a world where um, we've, we've got half as many vehicles being used as we might have at the moment or in a world where you know, the design and fabrication of materials can be done on an industrial scale, um, we're likely to see, I think, very significant uh, demand from the funders of the highway sector to take out costs on a very, very large scale. And that's going to be a challenge for the sector. Clearly, I think a shift from uh, new build into asset maintenance and asset extension, so getting the most out of our existing assets through scenario planning tools, use of sensors, predictive maintenance, and digital twins. A challenge, I guess, that the real-time data you know, is a great thing, but it also allows transport authorities and others to act and intervene in real time much more swiftly. And all kinds of operators um, of uh, highways infrastructure will, I think, be under increasing scrutiny and pressure in that regard. So that's a world we need to develop and live with. And finally, probably some sort of changing power dynamics. Uh, nobody knows exactly how the autonomous vehicles or the connected autonomous vehicles world is going to play, play out, but it's a reasonable bet that private ownership of vehicles will dramatically reduce and fleet owners will dramatically increase and increase their, their uh, system and market power. They're likely to become very dominant players in the highway sector and want greater influence on highways and roads than they, they have at the moment. So in order to prepare for this, you know, we in Arab are uh, sort of you know, developing our capabilities at pace. So in transport modeling, we're using machine learning methods for pedestrian modeling to provide a sort of that analysis and insight. Um, we're investing in large scale in data systems for transport modeling. A lot of folk doing similar kinds of things. We're using th machine learning for things like transport uh, and timetable optimization, all of them developing capabilities that we think are rooted in the you know, future data world that we live in. Likewise, in construction and maintenance, we've been using machine learning systems for clash detection. Um, it was a really productive example for us on light rail in Auckland, where we saved hundreds of hours of, of time using machine learning system in order to you know, do that for us. Uh, and developing in, in main asset maintenance inspect and things like machine learning corrosion inspection systems and tunnel crack detection systems that um, have the prospect of being cheaper and better at doing this than, than humans are at the moment. Uh, and then finally, new transport technologies. So a proposal that we, um, that we developed recently for flexible curbs, so daytime sort of change of, of, of curb use in order to reflect different user conditions, different transport conditions, different user needs. We've been very strongly involved in the um, UK Auto Drive program because connected and autonomous vehicles seems to us like a no-brainer uh, coming quite, quite quickly. And there was a presentation by a colleague of mine from Arab elsewhere in Highways UK over the last, uh, uh, in, in yesterday. And um, looking to the future of autonomous vehicles. So we, we designed the Uber Skyport. Um, it's, a, it's, kind of, it's, a, it's an image, obviously not a building at the moment, but actually if you were going to introduce autonomous vehicles into the urban environment, particularly autonomous aerial vehicles, what would that look like? How would that work? Can we start preparing for that now? So I think all ends up, um, as I said, we feel that AI and advanced digital technologies you know, are going to bring huge change. Um, the technologies are happening really fast and at, and at pace. I think they'll bring sort of enormous opportunities for the highway sector, but some challenges 
two, um, particularly around control, spend, power, and maintenance. Um, and as we in Arab have been sort of working really hard to get ahead of all of that and make sure that we can provide those capabilities out into the world. Andrew, over to you. As Will said, my name's Andrew. I run uh, engineering for DeepMind Health. Uh, DeepMind is a British uh, artificial intelligence research company um, acquired by Google a few years ago. Um, you may have heard of us when we beat uh, the world champion at the game of Go. Um, and we recently had a front cover on um, nature medicine around work we did for detecting uh, eye disease using machine learning models. Um, so uh, we're kind of known for being one of the world's best AI research um, centers. Uh, before then, though, um, I ran the uh, Google Maps engineering team for many years. And hopefully you're all familiar with uh, uh, this thing which everybody likes. Uh, this is the traffic layer on Google Maps. Um, this is what it generally looks like in downtown San Francisco, where I used to live, which is uh, mainly red and closed. Uh, and um, that's why people like it so much, because we can use uh, this uh, in Maps to help people make better decisions and hopefully save them time. Um, and you may or may not know, but the way we source this data is through background uh, location detection on your phone. And so when you start using Google Maps uh, for the very first time, it will take you for a flow and ask you for consent for us to lo record your location in the background. Um, and then we use that data anonymously um, to put these kind of red, yellow, and green lines uh, on the streets. Um, but a few of us thought, instead of helping consumers route around traffic using our products, could we somehow partner with cities to reduce that traffic um, at source through kind of better improvements in um, road design? And so we said, is it possible to take that very, very high level coarse grain um, data that we have just uh, in Google Maps to give people a rough idea of how busy it is uh, and turn that into the kind of data that people need for policy decisions? Uh, and so we kind of pulled that together and we partnered with TNO, which is a Dutch uh, research uh, institute. They have a fantastic traffic modeling team. Um, and they do a lot of work on uh, inductive loop sensors, which you probably know much more about than me, because I know nothing about highways. But the big, expensive loops of metal in the ground that do pretty uh, accurate vehicle counts. Um, uh, and we work with them to say, is it possible to use the kind of data that we collect in the background to replicate the data that you see from these counts? Um, well, we found it pretty much is. And so this is just kind of one um, uh, example of the blue line being what the ground truth from pieces of metal that are quite expensive to install and maintain uh, in the background. And then the green being uh, what you can create just uh, using the background data that you have in Google Maps um, anyway. Uh, and so you see we get the, the, the speeds correct. And overnight, when there are fewer cars on the road, um, you see you get a bit more noise in there, but when traffic is flowing, it's, it's at least as accurate as anything there. Um, so TNO did a very nice report that you can search for that, that kind of gives you uh, quite an ap academic analysis of the, the pros and cons of doing this. Um, but it does raise some quite interesting questions about the use of data. Um, Here's a nicer visualization of it. So the thing on the left is the standard uh, distance against time uh, speed graph from the inductive loop. And the one on the right is uh, from our data. Um, so you see kind of the shapes of the speed are about right. Um, there's obviously a lot more noise in our data on the right. And the noise is something we deliberately added in there um, for a reason I'll tell you about. So uh, We'll just mention some work that um, MIT did on um, New York. We also did a little bit of work with um, GEL, who are a public space design consultancy on uh, pedestrian flow in New York. And this is what a particular, you know, this is just from street view, but this is what New York streets tend to look like. Um, they're chock full of vehicles. Um, and in this case, what I would say about 70% or 80% of the vehicles in that shot are actually taxis, buses, public service vehicles. And the interesting thing about public service vehicles um, is that you know where they all are typically these days. Um, so uh, certainly in New York, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, each taxi has a GPS in the taxi. Um, and they know exactly where trips start, stop, uh, how long the trip lasted. Even um, how much people paid for the trip is all available 
um, as open data. So anybody can go and um, download this data. Um, and that brings some interesting questions, because one of the kind of um, the reason why we initially felt comfortable using Google's traffic data for policy decisions is that you know if you've got thousands of cars going down a particular street, um, you're never going to be able to um, to spot one particular individual. Like there's the kind of this kind of sense of wisdom of a crowd. You've got lots of different people. So long as the numbers of people you're talking about are large enough, um, your data is going to be. Um, anonymous, to quote the, the chap from Telefonica uh, in the previous talk. Um, the trouble is that if you look at one of those streets, um, 70 to 80 percent of those uh, vehicles were taxis, and you know the exact location of them. So we can take all these taxis, we can take the data that we have on other vehicles that we release, subtract the taxis that are freely available, and now instead of hundreds of vehicles on the street, you're actually tracking the movements of a handful of um, consumer vehicles, people who um, have not explicitly opted in to having their location revealed. Um, and you have to start asking yourself, like, is that an OK thing to do? Is it an OK thing to actually um, accidentally expose that kind of data? So the issue here is when you get these large-scale data sets, this one large-scale data set may well be anonymous. As soon as you start mixing these data sets together and subtracting one from the other, it gets non-anonymous pretty quickly. And you start learning things about people um, that you wouldn't otherwise learn. And in fact, if you search, um, researchers used the, the New York taxi data to um, plot the movements of people like Kim Kardashian and work out how much they tipped, uh, as well as where they went, which is not particularly great. Um, and so the noise I showed you um, uh, earlier on that graph, we uh, deliberately added in. So it's, it's uh, a mathematical technique that's developing called um, differential privacy. And the idea there is instead of just dealing with um, large numbers being anonymous, you take some numbers, and then you deliberately put noise into those uh, traffic statistics. Um, and that noise protects the value of the individual, so that when you start actually drilling down and, and referencing these data sets about other data sets, by the time you get down to one particular individual, you're just measuring noise. You can't tell anything about the individual anymore. Um, which all sounds fantastic and great, except that there is a trade-off there. The more noise you add in, the more privacy protection people have, the less useful the data is to make decisions. And so somebody has to, at some point, make the decision about how much noise do we think is, is acceptable? What is the boundary between total privacy and total utility um, of that data? Um, and I think that uh, that is one thing where I think the, the, the kind of pitch for this talk was how um, highways can learn from AI. I think there's a lot of ways in which technology companies can learn from the kind of things that, that, that happen in, in highway design and, and civil architecture in general. Um, because I've got, uh, obviously, a, a, a picture here of uh, um, one of Corbusier's development. There was this kind of grand master plan ages ago. So there was a desire that in terms of um, planning and construction and infrastructure engineering, um, a small group of really wise and careful people like Corbusier could just sit down um, and build out these massive, beautiful schemes, and everybody would live perfectly um, and efficiently, and everything would be wonderful, and life would be great. Um, and things didn't quite turn out that way. A few of these prototype schemes were built, uh, and as we saw, like people just don't want to live there. There was a rejection. Um, by the local population against these kind of master planning schemes. And, and directly off the back of that um, came the whole advert of public consultation in urban planning um, uh, and the use of infrastructure. And, and I was talking to some of Will's colleagues um, last week about some interesting work they're doing where when planning how to build tunnels for HS2, um, using some kind of um, uh, VR and modeling techniques to show a number of different possible um, tunnel options that you can then go to the local population and say, here are the pros and cons of these, these options. Can we get some feedback about what you want to do? Um, and so this whole concept of wide-based public consultation uh, and feedback is pretty embedded in the civil engineering and highway engineering space. And it largely isn't in software and technology at the moment. I mean, if you walk around here, you see lots of people um, selling new types of sensors. 
Um, you had uh, the chap up from Telefonica just before us um, selling quite fine-grained location data about how people move. And you have to ask yourself, how did society decide what is OK to sell about people and what is not OK to sell about people? And those decisions just haven't actually been made yet. Um, and I think uh, the kind of rich tradition of this public consultation in highway design is actually could teach technology a lot, especially as you all start thinking about how you integrate data more in your projects. And with that, I'll hand back to Will. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thanks, thanks, very, thanks very much, Andrew. So um, that was the session that we wanted to present to you, a little bit of a kind of run through a whole range of technology things on, on my side and a bit of a, frankly, a bit of a plug for us in Arab. Um, but from Andrew, like a bit of a deep dive on, on some of the really sort of nitty gritty issues around data that are so important now, but how those scale up just to be some quite significant challenges for, for the sector, but also actually what the sector can teach uh, technology companies about how, how we do that. So um, I don't know whether we've got any time at all or for any qu We have some time for some questions. So if anybody's got any questions for either myself or for Andrew, please do, um, please do fire away. Don't hang back. Private question. Uh, my question was for you personally, what's the most interesting project you're currently involved in? That's a very tough question to answer because I have a sort of global responsibilities in Arab. So um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of amazing stuff. I think... The one that I'm really excited about in this space is the work we're doing on uh, Queen's Ferry Crossing and the Fourth Road Bridge. Um, it's uh, because we, because Arup um, was part of the design of it, um, and as in, we've embedded a whole range of the sort of sensor data and the technologies, we can start bringing together structural engineering understanding of, of how that bridge is designed and built, with genuine understanding about how that's working in practice and how we can, we can truly sort of model what that looks like and we can truly uh, analyze how that sort of asset is performing in, in, in real life. And when I, um, w I joined Arup back in February this year and uh, a couple of months later, I, I, was, I said to my mum, she asked me the same question and uh, I said, you know, you never guess what, but I think long span bridges are really interesting and she virtually keeled over with boredom. But I, you know, so it wasn't exactly the answer I expected to give when I started working at Arab. But I think it's really where a lot of this stuff is coming, coming together. And you see actually creativity around engineering design. You see creativity around potential for new materials being developed. You certainly see all kinds of um, you know, fascinating stuff around life extension, around risk, around prediction, predictive maintenance. And you see something where um, we're particularly confident that we'll do this really well with those uh, long span bridges, and that will be applicable for a whole range of assets that are all array, array around the world. So I think it's a great example of how some of these new technologies are coming together to provide new approaches to design, new approaches to maintenance, new approaches to uh, operations you know, in, a, in a really exciting and, and powerful way. This is a, um, a question for Andrew. I just wanted to ask, it's more of a satire my own personal curiosity. When you do the Google Maps data, particularly the estimated journey time, do you have a data set that says the speed limits on the roads, or do you just simply use the kind of speeds that people do on those roads? Uh, we, this is on, yeah. um, we look at the speed that people do on those roads. We do have a data set of the speed limits on those roads. Um, so that's something we created ourselves. So uh, the data behind Google Maps is entirely created by Google um, as of about um, Eight years ago now, we used to source data from Navtech and Teleatlas, who are big common data providers. Um, we, that was getting more and more expensive, um, so we took a decision to create everything uh, ourselves through um, some machine learning, uh, a lot of human operators, and all of the street view uh, data and satellite data. Um, so we get um, speed limit data from Street View. So we have machine learning systems that run across Street View imagery and pull out um, street limit signs. When we try to use that in practice to make journey time decisions, it's not accurate enough um, because there aren't enough uh, the, the particular fine grains around like where the speed limit zone starts and stops. And the you know what matters when you're doing the journey time planning is not what the speed limit is, but actually how fast the cars are, are traveling. And so um, yeah, we just use that. I have another question for Andrew. Um, on your the, um, heat maps of the um, traffic densities over the yeah. time, um, you had the noise included on your um, plots generated from the Google data yes. set, right? Yeah. Um, 
it seems odd to me that you would run, you would uh, anonymize that data set when um, the output of that process is entirely kind of a collective dynamic. And isn't it inherently anonymous in that sense? And shouldn't there be more work in potentially data segregation that you collect? I don't understand why you have to have the data all anonymized to then go on to do a process that is inherently anonymous because it's sort of a collective dynamic. It seems, I don't know if I've missed the point, but are there, I know that's a, you've given that example, but aren't there other examples where it is not necessary, like, oh, um, an overhead to do that anonymity, sorry, I hate that word, anonymity. Um, do you see, see what I'm getting at? I feel that it, yeah. it's an important point, but there are processes where we're looking at collective yeah. behavior. And so your, your, your question is um, that uh, that data set seems inherently anonymous given the, the kind of scale of what you're talking about. So, um, so the interesting thing from privacy theory um, that people have worked out recently is it's very, very difficult to tell whether or not something is anonymous or not like in, in theory. So, for example, I think everybody here um, would think that if I gave you a raw traffic count and said, um, during this hour, 800 vehicles passed this point, everybody would say, well, of course it's anonymous because 800, it's very difficult to, to lower down. And perhaps different people have exact thresholds about when they would class something as anonymous, but you know that kind of ballpark. The trouble is, is that if you have another super accurate data source, like taxi vehicles or something, which also seems anonymous, that says um, there have been 790 taxis down this particular road during the same time period, you subtract the two, and what you're saying is that there are 10 normal public vehicles that have gone down this road at this particular point. And suddenly, that's not anonymous. Suddenly, when you know that there are 10 public vehicles going down this road at this particular time, you're like halfway to finding out who these people are. Um, and, and the real challenge there is that you can't, it, well, you, there is no way to work out in advance whether or not something can be combined with other data elsewhere. And so you pretty much have to protect everything at source because you don't know how it's going to be used elsewhere. Or you don't protect it, and we as society say, I'm willing to take the risk. But in order to do that, you need a way for society to say we're willing to take the risk, and we don't have that yet. But I think, that, I, I think this, this general approach of, of thinking quite hard about privacy and identifiability in advance of data collection methods is, is a quite a significant one. That's certainly something, you know, for having myself had the experience of working in DeepMind and really seeing all of the stuff that Andrew and his colleagues are doing there, I've personally brought into Arab quite strongly, you know, because you, you, people I don't think are fully aware of just how powerful some of these jigsaw techniques can be and how um, easy it is to find out the identity of people if you really have some quite, you know, significant um, data, data capabilities. So you've got to kind of design that in an advance rather than sort of going in there like crazy and then figuring out a few months later, oh my God, I've got a privacy problem and I need to sort it out. It's really encourage anybody to start thinking about that you know, as intrinsically as part of the efforts they're getting underway. Hi, um, I have a question kind of around uh, sort of validation and I guess quality assurance of machine learning algorithms. So I just want to know if there's any sort of established practice or processes for uh, validating those machine learning algorithms, considering that a lot of the data sets that we get and feed into those algorithms can be very biased or yeah. uh, got a lot of gaps in them. Um, you know, how do we ensure that what we're getting out of that machine learning algorithm is actually true and valid and good and useful? I'll definitely uh, leave that one for Andrew. The, that's an, an excellent question. Um, the short answer is um, I don't think anybody has a completely foolproof um, way of, of doing that. Um, the best you can do is, um, you know, I think often, particularly in this industry, what you're doing is you're using some kind of fancy sensor or some machine learning to vastly reduce the cost of collecting data that would otherwise be very expensive. So one way to validate that is to actually um, take that low-cost machine learning approach um, and actually do a formal academic style analysis with um, expense, the, the results that you get from expensive infrastructure, which is kind of what we did when we compared mobile data against um, induction loop data. Um, probably a better um, uh, part of that question that you asked is, is how do you avoid bias in that data? 
Um, because, I mean, they, uh, there have been untold reports of bias in machine learning based systems all the way from um, most facial recognition systems um, perform far poorly on people of color rather than on middle-aged white people because the, the data that we use train these systems. And if you're, for example, um, you're trying to use an electronic passport gate, um, that's actually a significant problem because like, suddenly these things don't, don't work. Um, uh, there are much scarier examples from the uh, US criminal justice system around sentencing guidelines. Um, there's a fantastic report by ProPublica, which is probably the, the textbook example of machine learning, uh, bias in machine learning affecting real world decisions. Um, the, uh, the only real way um, you can avoid that is when you do the validation part of the uh, machine learning model. Um, don't just validate it against the, uh, a, a sample of the population because then you get regression to the mean. Actually go in and segment that population and say, I'm going to particularly validate against this group of people, this group of people, this group of people. Um, so for example, I, one of the stands down there I noticed had some fancy radar-based technology for detecting people waiting at um, uh, pedestrian crossings. It would be fantastic to know if that works as well for children as it does for adults. I get my guess would be it almost certainly doesn't would be my guess. But so you need to actually um, test that. And um, ideally, what I would like to, to see is people building machine learning models in future being required to, to publish explicitly as part of that model. What steps did you take to avoid bias when constructing that that model? Um, I think we're still probably five years away from having a, a standardized format for, for doing that. Then. If, if, if I can just, uh, just add to that, one of the slightly, uh, what's happening in artificial intelligence and machine learning is just an explosion of brilliance and creativity. But one of the odd things about it is it's very handcrafted at the moment. So there aren't general theories about why certain kinds of neural networks but work better than others. It's like, well, if it works better, that's the proof you need. But there's not a fundamental structure and theory to it, which is the reason why we have some of these problems. I mean, as well as what Andrew said, the other thing I'd say is think about your own, if, it's, if you're working in a company or in an in a agency, think about your own quality assurance processes and the kinds of questions you'll ask about anything that's new that comes towards you and ask the very same questions of the machine learning systems that are being brought you know, before you are. You know, how robust are they? What, what oversight have they had? How have they been tested? You know, are you, have you done A, B approaches to them? Have you used them in, a, in, in one area and checked out whether it's working or not? Those, those are the kind of good standard quality questions that we should be asking of anything that we do, and that includes all of the new systems that are being developed, I think. Good, okay. Okay, okay. well, from Andrew and myself, thank you very much for attending this session. Hope you enjoyed it, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank, thank you. you.